uh, we can go now with uh, Klaus Lammerzahl uh, as the next uh, as the next speaker. Klaus uh, has made an effort. He was giving lectures uh, uh, in his uh, course in Bremen, but uh, he has uh, just rushed uh, to come to our presentation. Klaus, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm just. Can you see that now? Yes. Okay, wonderful. I'll make the full screen. So thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I'm very glad that, uh, that I could be um, yeah, with you. Unfortunately, in, not in Isfahan, but uh, at least here online. And uh, thank you for the invitation. And I will talk about new high precision test of general Relativity. So first, I, uh, I have a particular intro, uh, so the approach to uh, that. This is a constructive axiomatic approach, uh, and this is what I will talk first, and then I will go to the consequences of uh, of general relativity, and then I uh, highlight two tests. This is uh, the test of the University of Free Fall with microscope, and uh, the test of the University of the gravitational redshift with Galileo, and then I. Uh, come uh, to a further effect uh, if there's time and uh, come to some in output. So um, the approach is uh, based on the axiomatic approach by Elas Pirani and Schild who take a few uh, axioms, operational axioms, which you can test by experiment and then they derive that, that uh, the geometry of space and time is of a Riemannian structure. And the uh, the uh, argument law runs as follows. So, so we have uh, at first the um, axiom that there's a uniqueness of light propagation in each direction. There's only one light ray uh, leaving us and one light ray approaching us and, and not many light rays. And this then gives uh, a uniqueness uh, structure, with the uniqueness of the light cones. You also have to uh, treat here some, some some topological uh, subtleties, but uh, this uh, <laughs> uh, is under control. And uh, from that one can derive that there's a geometric, uh, already with the light propagation, a part of geometry has been Im imposed on the, on, on the space-time. And this is, uh, can, is, so to say, locally we have uh, something like special relativity without a certain length, a conformal special relativity. The next uh, axiom, uh, and here are uh, the list of, uh, of uh, experiments. So there are very precise experiments, lab, ex lab experiments uh, going from, uh, from 10 to minus 10 to 10 to minus 30 or so. Um, the next point is to require to have the universality of free fall, and that is uh, what I will also talk about. Uh, that means that all particles fall in the gravitational way, uh, field in, in in the same way, all non-gravitational uh, uh, forces has to be shielded, and um, this has been tested on Earth with, uh, with in incredible uh, precision, with a uh, uh, 10 to minus with a precision of 10 to minus 13 in terms of the Hilbert coefficient. And with microscope, we are now approaching uh, that it is two orders of magnitude better. On also had some uh, experiments with particles with the spin, with charged particles, and we are looking forward to have tests uh, of, the, of the University of Free Fall with anti-particles. Um, of course, we know that there is no superluminal um, real propagation, um, material, pro material propagation. Um, so that means that all particles which we are observing should have a velocity smaller than the velocity of light. This also has been proven very, very nicely. And um, so with, uh, uh, with, with laboratory tests, you reach 10 to minus 6. And with astro particles, uh, that is uh, comparing high energy protons or other particles with the photons, you uh, can reach a precision of 10 to minus 21. So there's no and this 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 um, axiom, which can be tested by experiment or has been tested by experiment, now makes a connection between the structure given by the free fall and the structure given by light. And together, this gives a, gives a conformal structure uh, that is a wild geometry. And 
there is still this file potential which can be can be get rid of by the last axiom that is the uniqueness of clocks or the uniqueness of quantum mechanics or how it's called by will um, local position invariance. This means if you have two identical clocks and 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 to propagate them along two different paths, then in general the clocks show a different time. But within this framework, they still may also have a different ticking rate. But this has never been observed. The uh, the properties of clocks in terms of ticking rates and so on do not depend on the on the history of the clocks. That is, quantum mechanics is also unique. And um, this has been tested very nicely. And uh, if we require this, then the result will be that gravity or all, all together is called the einstein equivalence principle. And the result is that gravity is described by a curve in space time. That is, the, uh, the resulting degree of freedom uh, can be encoded into a index uh, tensor and this has a uh, uh, plays a role of uh, of of a metrical tensor um, there's also uh, there is no axiomatic approach to the Einstein field equation you know how to write that so I just mentioned them so you can of course uh, make a parametrized post Newtonian um, uh, framework and uh, test uh, <coughs> you know, how certain deviations of the Einstein field equation uh, may look like and which consequences they have, but this, this is not an axiomatic approach. This is uh, just exploring all the decrease of freedom beyond the Einstein field equation. Uh, for example, in the PPN formism, there's not uh, included the um, uh, aspects of of, uh, of the Finstall geometry, which might uh, also be the geometry of space time. And in the historical context, this uh, just the, uh, the uh, story of the compatibility between Newton mechanics and electrodynamics leading to special relativity and uh, special relativity with the Newton gravity leading to general relativity. And now we are looking what is the compatibility between GR and quantum mechanics. Um, one also has to uh, think about what is, uh, and, and this is part of, uh, of the Einstein field equation, how the uh, gravitational field of the gravitating bodies look like. We know that it is to very high accuracy, it's given by Newtonian potential, but one also should uh, discuss deviations. One type of deviation is given by a Yukawa potential, and you know that there are small scale experiments and uh, large scale experiments, and the best uh, is, is uh, so say on the scale of lunar laser ranging and of, uh, of satellite laser ranging. <coughs> and here one, one, one has very nice tests in the in the in the micrometer and sub micrometer domain, but if you if you go to a smaller scale, then the um, then the tests become not as good. So that means the estimate on the alpha becomes low. One also may discuss anisotropic uh, effects in, in, the, uh, in the deviations uh, from uh, Newtonian gravitational fields. This is, uh, has been developed within the framework uh, of Kosteletsky, um, um, discussing um, uh, quantized gravity effects, in, uh, uh, which, which uh, may uh, depend on uh, on um, on um, breaking of loans in variance and, and this has been tested by atom interferometry and by uh, the lunar laser ranging uh, very quickly after the proposal and then and the result is that the, all the coefficients are smaller than 10 to minus 5 up to 10 to minus 9 and another issue which is also basic to um, uh, our um, framework for uh, gravity, and which is also related to the to the to the Einstein field equation, is the question of active and passive gravitational mass. So this has been introduced by Bondi, and so if you have um, if you have a body, then this body may have an active mass, that is the mass which creates a gravitational field, a passive gravitational mass which reacts on the gravitational field, and the inertial mass as we know it. If you if one writes down the coupled system on the Newtonian level of this um, of of a, of a two-body system uh, with these three masses, then we get this uh, this set of equations. One can uh, calculate the center of mass 
motion, and one sees that the center of mass motion shows the self acceleration if the ratio of active and passive gravitational masses are different, uh, depend on the body. And uh, if you have, um, so to say, the Earth Moon system and look what, what will be the consequence of that, then it's, a, then it's a, an out or in spiraling of, uh, of, the, um, of the motion of the Moon. Uh, so this is uh, in the uh, question of actio equal reactio for gravity. And if C21 is equal to zero for all the bodies, then it's of the same level than the, uh, than the uh, ordinary occurrence principle, what, what we know, the equality of, uh, of passive gravitational mass and the inertial mass. Here we have another occurrence principle. And there were also tests already by um, Kreutzer in this, uh, in, in 1968, sorry, 1968 uh, in the group of Robert Dickey. He just took uh, two bodies of different um, materials, but of the same weight, the same weight. If they have the same weight, then one asks whether they have, whether they create the same gravitational field. If they do not create the gravitational field, let's say if the red mass should create a, a larger gravitational field, then this, this torsion pendulum here should, should be on the left-hand side attracted a bit more to, towards the red mass than this here. And if one now um, interchanges the masses, then the torsion pendulum should start to swing if you are at the resonance frequency. This has not been observed, so there's an estimate that the C12 is smaller than 10 to minus 5. Also, lunar laser ranging has been used for that. Um, one can write up all the forces. So the, the issue is that, there's, um, that the moon depends on two types of materials. One aluminum um, um, or silicon mantle and an, and an iron core. So, uh, so you have two masses which, uh, which, are, uh, which are of different materials and two center of masses for these two, two, two materials. And then there should be an a force in the direction of S head, and this should lead to a um, to a increase of the of the radial velocity of the of the moon. This is a component here. This should lead then to a to an increase of the distance to uh, from the Earth. This also has been never observed, and since lunar laser ranging is very precise, one could draw an estimate here of the order 10 to minus 13. And uh, we are looking whether new uh, Lunar laser ranging observations and a better model of the Earth uh, from from uh, from Grail or other missions may lead to a further improvement of this estimate. Um, another point one has to mention is uh, that uh, this in, within this framework, general relativity defines what is rotation and what is time. So if you have an if you have an observer and a passing particle, both need not to move on geodesics, but we can assume this, of course. So then one can send light rays from the observer to the, to the nearby particle. They will be reflected. And this then gives you a, dist a, a, a measure of the distance in terms of the parameter, of the clock parameter, which is defined along the trajectory of the observer. And now, if we now require that if the observer is freely falling and if particles are freely falling, and if you require that the relative, that, yeah, then we have a measure of the distance, we can make a time derivative, derivative and we have a measure of the, of the relative velocity. It's the second time derivative, a measure of the relative acceleration. If we now require that the relative acceleration vanishes, for all freely falling particles, if we assume all the freely falling observer, then this singles out a certain parameter along the observer's world line. And this parameter then is the proper time, which is given by the space time metric we just introduced a few slides ago. So, general relativity and the motion of, of the bodies within general relativity defines what are a standard clock. What is a standard clock? What are the good clocks within general relativity? If you have a good clock, then you, if, if you have a standard clock, then you, are, of course, also can define a standard distance. So with a, with a proper time, you can also have a, stand, a proper spatial distance here. And 
again with a light and three particles one can define what rotation is. This is called the Pirani uh, construction, the bouncing photon construction. You have a central word line and two auxiliary word lines. Light goes back and forth between the auxiliary word lines and always meet the central particles and always hit the auxiliary word lines. This means that the um, that the auxiliary word lines are in general not geodetic. Uh, we also do not make any assumption about the central particle. But this defines also a propagation, a timeline, timeline propagation of, um, of a spatial direction given by the, by the light rays. And this then defines non-rotation. And everything which, uh, which moves with respect to this non-rotating vector, then is called rotation. OK, so general relativity tells you what is what are good clocks and what is, uh, what is rotation. And regarding the, the clocks, we, of course, have to ask whether our best clocks, the atomic clocks, are standard clocks in this sense. So this has not yet been shown. This is just a geometric construction here with point particles and light rays. And, and atomic clocks are uh, based on quantum mechanics. Yeah? But it has been shown by Parker and Pimentel in the 80s that the energy levels are influenced by the curvature of space-time um, at this level, the curvature times the Bohr radius squared. So in principle, atomic clocks are not standard clocks in principle. But if you look at Earth, then this, this modification of the, of the energy levels leads to modification of the frequencies of the order of 10 to minus 42. This is far beyond experimental reach. And therefore, atomic clocks are really good standard clocks uh, uh, in the in our environment of the solar system. Only if you approach stellar black holes, then this may change. Okay, and, and these are the clocks. This, these are the, the, the clocks, the standard clocks and the atomic clocks, which are standard clocks, are the clocks which are used for describing the gravitational redshift or the gravitational time delay or gravitational clock effect or, or, or Doppler effect or something like that. Okay, now we have our framework, Einstein field equation, to equation of motion and, and what is proper time. And then we can look at all the effects which are around here. So we have all the light effects, the deviation of light, gravitation lensing, uh, up, up to the, the shadow of black holes. We have orbital effects. Uh, the first one was the perihelion shift and the lensing effect, which has been seen by, by, by uh, by satellite motion and also the back reaction, um, which describes that the loss of gravitational energy, has been confirmed uh, by means of uh, pulsar uh, observations and gravitational waves. And we also have effects on extended bodies. And this is the, uh, the spin spin coupling, which is, uh, plays a role here. This is, in terms of general relativity, this is a gravitomagnetic effect. This is a lensing effect, all this is a gravitomagnetic effect. This, but but these are completely different physical methods. This is an orbital effect, and this is a this is a local effect acting on a on a on a, on a spinning top. Um, and this ha has been shown by gravity probe. And this finally, there are effects on clocks, the gravitational redshift, the gravitational time delay, best test by Cassini, and we are proposing a gravitational clock effect. And then, of course, we have the uh, prediction of, of uh, gravitational waves, and I do not talk about all the special relativistic effects. Now I come to two experiments uh, where we are a partner of. This is the microscope experiment uh, regarding the University of Free Fall and the Galileo, uh, the use of the Galileo satellites and, and the corresponding test of the gravitational redshift. So the uh, microscope mission is, um, is a mission which is under the lead of France, uh, but with contributions from ESA and Germany, uh, the DESARM and the, the Physikalisch-Technische Bundesanstalt. And the mission goal is to have a test of the equivalence principle of, an, of, of the order of 10 to minus 15, that is two orders of magnitude improvement regarding two lab experiments. It's a small satellite, 800 kilometer height, and uh, the mission lifetime was about two years. The payload are two, uh, two differential accelerometers. One, one sensor was, uh, between, uh, was made of two masses, titanium and platinum. 
and the reference sensor all just two platinum test masses just as a, a common mode rejection procedure to, to improve the, the measurement. Okay, so these are the test masses. So you have here uh, the test masses and uh, you have electronic uh, uh, surfaces there. And with that, you can, uh, you can operate or um, orientate the uh, inner test mass with respect to the outer test mass. There is no connection between them, but, uh, but you have electrostatic forces which can, which, which can handle these, uh, these, uh, these electrodes. As these, uh, these test masses, so they have, you have 18 electrodes by which you can control these uh, test masses. This here are the, um, the, uh, the full setup, and this is how, how this is built into the satellite. And here you see the uh, two test masses are freely falling with respect to each other, and you have to look, uh, one has to make sure that the, that the inner test mass does not hit the outer test mass, and so we think for that we need the uh, electrodes. The mission concept is shown here in this figure. You have two, the outer uh, cylinder and the inner cylinder, both are freely falling. And if the inner cylinder feels a stronger gravitational field than the outer cylinder, this would be the consequence of a violation of the equivalence principle, then the inner cylinder would start to oscillate with respect to the, to the outer test mass. Here in this configuration, the test mass, the, uh, the oscillation would be of, um, uh, would be related to the orbital, to the orbital period. Yeah, but if you now, in addition, rotate the, uh, the satellite uh, around an axis which is orthogonal, orthogonal to the orbital plane, then you can decouple that and move a hypothetical signal to any value you want to have. And this is the um, the main idea here. To decouple systematic effects from uh, from the measurement uh, from from the effect you want to you want to measure, um, so that is we have uh, the orbital uh, frequency and the spin frequency of the satellite, and this makes so to say the frequency where we expect any uh, violation of the equivalence principle. So this are uh, this is the satellite is one. It's, it's practically one cubic meter with all what you need for that. Uh, if you see the test masses here, the accelerometer, one of, one of these differential accelerometers looks really complicated and two of, of them uh, flying in space. And uh, these are the test masses. They have to be manufactured in a very, very precise way. This could only be done by the, by the PTP and Braunschweig. The materials are very expensive, and you need to machine this in a micro with micrometer precision. An essential feature was a gold wire between the two test masses, a gold wire of a point of a, of seven micrometer diameter. Um, you need that in order to avoid charging, which of course will spoil all would, would spoil all the experiments. So you do need a wire, and this was a crucial. A, a crucial component of the whole of the whole setup, and this required special treatment. Finally, uh, there was the launch, and um, yeah, with this launch, one could then uh, test. Uh, yeah, one, one started to test the equivalence principle. This is the um, the measurement principle. So you have here the inner test mass and the electrodes, and you can measure any motion of the inner test mass with respect to the outer test mass through a, through a capacitive measurements, uh, which is related to a force since the uh, gradient of the, of, the, of the electrostatic potential within the capacitors then uh, 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 is uh, not position independent, so it depends on the position, so the capacity depends on the position and then the gradient uh, gives a force which can be measured. And uh, this is uh, so, so that the basic principle of, um, of how the measurement has been confirmed, uh, has been performed. This is the, uh, the um, spectral noise density of the, of the measurement of the relative acceleration. So here is the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, yeah, the looked for signal. It is, it is not there, so there is no, no variation of the equivalence principle, and here's the, here's the peak, which is, which is related to the, orbital, to the orbital plane. 
And uh, so this is, um, you, this is the uh, science unit and this is the reference unit. And um, um, these are the uh, decrease of the of the of the uh, of the errors in the uh, in the differential acceleration after the number of orbits. So the, the statistics uh, here um, uh, leads to this increase. And at the end, you we, we then had um, at the as a first result at the end of 2017. That the equivalence principle is, a, is a true uh, up to the order 10 to minus. Five minutes left. Four. Five minutes left. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. And uh, we are, uh, and, and there's another publication with, uh, with an improvement, and, and we are working on the final publication. So the next thing is uh, the gravitational redshift. You know that this has been tested first <coughs> in, uh, in the Stanford by Pond and Repka. 30 meters, uh, 22.5 meters height high difference for using the most power effect. But then in the 60s, the uh, atomic clocks has been used and it's really nice that after 10 years, uh, there was already a space experiment with these atomic clocks. So the uh, transition from ground instruments to space in, in, instruments is uh, always, uh, is, uh, in some cases, really, really fast. Here, the test was about the alpha, the alpha, so the frequency, the, the relative change of the frequency is related to the potential difference of the Newtonian potential. The question is whether this is true for all the clocks and, and so there, or whether this is constant or whether this is true or not. So we are looking for an, for, for an alpha. And this uh, first space test by Vesso and Levine uh, gave a result of 10 to minus 4 estimate for the alpha and this was just one parabolic flight of 10,000 kilometers height uh, down and the, during this flight the hydrogen maser in the in the rocket has been compared with the hydrogen maser on on ground uh, during this flight and this is indeed led to the result. Now if you know that in 2014 there was the launch of Galileo 5 and 6 the two regularly op operating Galileo satellites, at least according to the plan, but there was a malfunction of the of the upper stage of the, of, of the Soyuz rocket, and they uh, were launched into an eccentric orbit with a 0.2 eccentricity, so daily we are at a high height difference of 11,600 kilometers, but they went through the Van Allen belt, so they took the, um, the uh, rest of the fuel, uh, for for a correction, and so that after the correction, they had the eccentricity of uh, 0.116. But this still means that uh, two times a day you have a height difference of 8,730 kilometers. This all almost 10,000 kilometers. And taking into account that that they, say that they have at, at, atomic clocks with them, that that means every day you have two times a GPA experiment. So this was a was a starting idea, and here are the orbits. This is the uh, the uh, original orbit, the wrong orbit. Green are the targeted orbit, and blue is um, is uh, is orbit after correction. <laughs> and I think Einstein was very happy for this uh, for this uh, malfunction of the satellite because now we can test the equivalence uh, the uh, redshift. The uh, atoms are passive hydrogen masers with of the order ten to minus. 14 precision um, uh, would rubidium atom clocks uh, again with 10 to minus 14 precision and um, one can now for the orbits and calculate what is what is the time difference and this is given here by in in terms of the Keplerian orbital elements in, in, in this way here and this means that uh, uh, per orbit we have uh, we have uh, uh, Gain of the of the time of the order 10 uh, 370 nanoseconds, and um, in order to really measure the uh, frequency change or the time, the redshift, we need um, pseudo range measurements. So all the uh, all the times which uh, are uh, needed for light rays or signals going from Earth to uh, to the, 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 the satellites and so on, with all the influences on the atmosphere. And the, and the instrument noises and the multi-part errors and so on and the clockwise 
and also the clocks are not really well working. You see green is well working, red is not working, and there's also something in between. On first sight, the um, theory completely agrees with what is the observation, but if you uh, subtract this, then we see a, a noisy uh, a signal there. And then now we discuss this a noisy signal in terms of, uh, of the square fit. Uh, this aspect also took into account the gravitational moment of the Earth. And then we, we discussed everything. So, so, so we got, um, we discussed which clock worked well. So we have various data sets. Uh, we took these two data sets. Finally, we, we restricted to this data set, the, the uh, clock five here, which is best. And um, it is, it is given here. And uh, this is the, uh, the increase of the, of the stability after time. And uh, we discussed uh, whether, are, uh, whether temperature effects might influence that magnetic fields of the Earth. Uh, there's a mismodeling of systematics during, during the orbit, solar radiation pressure, uh, Earth albedo, uh, tidal potentials of Earth and moon, moon and sun. Everything could, could be in, included and could be explained. And also we discussed whether there, there might be effects of, uh, of clocks on ground. Uh, so we, we modeled the whole Galileo satellite in the computer, had, uh, had also a laser ranging campaign with the ESA to uh, test our models. And everything was well, um, um, well worked, worked out very well. And uh, finally then we got, um, and, and as I told we, we we, we, we discussed extensively uh, possible influences of the temperature and possible influences of the, of the, the magnetic field of the Earth. And finally, we uh, end up with, um, with a result that there was an effect of the order of two points, 10 to minus five here. So this is an, an increase of the order uh, of the factor five in the, in the accuracy of the test of the gravitational redshift with, uh, with clocks. And this then ended up with, um, with uh, the cover article of physical review letter. There was uh, another group in Paris, uh, also, um, uh, also who, who, who also carried out this, uh, this uh, analysis independently, and we both uh, got the same result. Okay, this uh, is uh, what I want to talk. There might be another effect which is due to the gravitomagnetic field of so this is a care parameter here. If you have a clock standing, uh, in, if you have two clocks which move around the Earth in different directions, then you, you can do this in the equatorial plane and non-equatorial plane, or you can do this in general relativity, that we defined a new observable. And uh, then what comes out is that there would be a time difference of the order of 0 0.5, 10 to minus 7 seconds. Um, this uh, might uh, here 10 to minus 8 seconds, so, so, or of the order 10 to minus 7 seconds. This might be measurable, but the uh, problem is in the detail that is the, uh, the spin urge of the orbit. So we are just working on that. And uh, I will not go into detail here. Um, and you know, all these are further unresolved questions within general relativity, but this is not the topic of my talk. So I thank you very much. So the summary is the take home mm -hmm. messages is that there are no single tests contradicting general or special relativity. What is not yet really directly measured as a gravitomagnetic clock, clock effect, of course, the big problems is, uh, is uh, the incompatibility between quantum mechanics and, uh, and the general relativity and the issue of dark matter. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you, thank you again. We have question uh, time possibly for uh, one question very rapidly, and then we have to proceed to the next lecture. If uh, uh, there is no urgent question, it's very interesting, this reference to the very uh, work of Machon, which still has to be um, looked in the future. And, this, and uh, thank you again for uh, the presentation. And we can proceed to the next uh, lecture.
Okay, so I'm out now. Very much. Good morning. You are online. Okay, good morning to everyone. I should uh, ask to the organizer. Okay, now I can share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. You okay. Have 25 minutes plus five minutes of discussion. Fine. Okay. Good morning to everyone uh, and thank you for your kind invitation. Uh, in this uh, talk, uh, we will speak uh, about uh, a very particular topic uh, in the scientific part of the exploration of our system the exploration of a Mercury planet. And we will see what are the links. Uh, with, in particular, gravitational, uh, gravitational physics. So let us start uh, from almost the end. In uh, 20 October 2018, this is the, the launch of the Bepi Colombo mission uh, directed toward Mercury. And why we are interested into the exploration of the planet Mercury? Okay. Here it is uh, a picture taken from the messenger probe on in its first flyby. Okay, planet Mercury is interesting for science for a series of uh, reasons. First of all, it is the innermost planet of the solar system, and we have to, to say it is very difficult to reach. Uh, if you do a very simple calculation, you can see that with a simple ballistic flight, you should require a probe with almost entirely uh, its mass by fuel. And so, in the course of the 60s mainly, techniques based on the so-called flybys have been developed in order to reach this planet. Second, the harsh environment. Mercury is near to the sun, it's very hot, so it's difficult also to stay here. And then, expert in solar system formation and evolution says it is a keystone in order to uh, understand the uh, formation of our solar system. And so uh, a study of internal structure, composition, thermal evolution are very important in order to do that. And here comes first time gravitation, since we know that measurement of the gravitational field of a body is one of the few things in order to see what's inside. And then the first mission to Mercury, Minor 10, in the 1970s, discovered an unexpected magnetic field. So what does it produce, this magnetic field? And then, and we are all very interested in this, we know that uh, Mercury is close to the Sun, and we know that uh, it has done in history a very important role in development and subsequent tests of general relativity. Uh, we all know this, uh, that the very, very famous uh, 43 seconds of dark per century possession of the perihelion of Mercury was uh, uh, a problem, uh, a feature that was not uh, explainable by classical celestial mechanics, as this guy, Urbain Le Verrier, among other astronomers, uh, did a lot of effort in order to explain this. And here uh, we find a very, very familiar situation. Uh, two solutions were, have been proposed. Uh, some people say, okay, uh, you have to change the law. The Newtonian law of gravitation is not anymore valid. It's not one over a square, the force. Yeah. Sorry? Okay. Uh, it's not one over a square, but perhaps one uh, over R to the 2.5. And so we have to modify the law of gravitation. Other people say, no, 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 the, the law of gravitation is fine. There some, should be some other bodies, uh, they named one hypothetical called Vulcan, who, who should produce a further perturbation which should explain this, um, 
this uh, anomalous behavior of Mercury orbit. In the end, we know that the first hypothesis was, uh, we could say, right, since uh, Einstein's general relativity could brilliantly explain this precession. But we find this is a very familiar situation, which is a sort of paradigm also valid in the 20th and 21st century, thanks to the so-called dark matter, dark energy problems. Each time, we are faced between uh, having to modify our fundamental theories or to find for some missing matter. And here we, we come to uh, Giuseppe Colombo. Uh, Giuseppe Colombo was a very important uh, scientific figure, Italian scientist, mathematician, engineer. In its uh, not, unfortunately, not so long life, uh, he, uh, did a very impressive series of achievements. He found with Irving Shapiro that uh, the, the ratio between revolution and rotation period of Mercury uh, that was solved before to be one to one was indeed three to two. He contributed in a crucial way to the Mariner tent trajectory design and he did other very important achievements. So it's uh, uh, figure is very tied to the exploration of uh, applied Mercury and in general uh, the solar system, especially with regards to celestial mechanics and the study of gravitation. And indeed, uh, as I said before, uh, reaching uh, Mercury is not so easy. We have to go very deep inside the gravitational potential well of the sun. And up today, only two, we could say now three, uh, missions have explored Mercury. The first is Mariner 10 in the 70s. The second is the Messenger probe in the not so much years ago. It, that was the first probe to, to be put, to be placed in a stable orbital configuration around the planet. And then there is the uh, our, it's an ESA mission, Bepi Colombo, was been launched, as I say, in 2018, and it, which is traveling towards Mercury. Uh, Baby Colombo is a very complicated mission. It's composed by two different uh, spacecraft uh, traveling together, and then once in Mercury, they will be separated. Among the various scientific objectives, we are, of course, very, very interested into the gravitational part. But let us do a step aside and see what does it mean to study gravitational physics with a probe. Okay, we know that uh, uh, doing a uh, gravitational physics experiment in space is very costly, uh, very, very costly for a host of reasons uh, we uh, well know. So it is customary to use uh, every opportunity to do some of piggyback. So try to install some dedicated uh, gravitational uh, physics package onto a mission which is uh, designed for doing other things. And uh, what, what, what are we trying to do with such packages? Uh, first of all, uh, we want to test uh, these basic things, the, the gravitational equation of motion in a very specific environment. Here it is the uh, somehow complicated the question of motion of a body, which is uh, uh, predicted by the Wakefield version of general relativity, indeed, uh, in the parameterized post newtonian formalism. And we see that, okay, we, we want to, at the end, verify whether the prediction of the orbit based on these uh, theoretical frameworks agrees with uh, reality. And how we do that? Okay, we, we must follow in some way the probe in it. And in order to do that, we have, first of all, see what is the probe. The probe must be something close to the test mass, a gravitational test mass. Uh, with this concept, we need a probe which is so small that its gravitational field could not perturb the gravitational field it want to measure. And this is uh, usually the case with a very small uh, probe in orbit around the planet or around the sun. And we have to follow its motion. This is, uh, <clears throat> this is called tracking. Uh, and there are 
several ways to do that. Uh, all of them basically involve the <clears throat> exchange of microwave signals between account station. Here you can see <clears throat> one of the uh, NASA uh, antennas, which uh, routinely track the probes. And basically we have two observables called the range, which is the instantaneous station satellite distance, and the range rate, which is the instantaneous slant velocity, basically the Doppler shift. And this uh, task, which is simple uh, in practice, is very in theory, is very complicated in practice and requires a very complex infrastructure, especially considering that the coverage should be 24 hours per day. Uh, the observables uh, have an extending precision with the most precise uh, equipment, and we are speaking about KA band uh, rate, which means 32, 36 gigahertz of frequency. The uh, precision on the range rate could uh, reach 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6 meters per second. While the precision in uh, range it is below the meter. Now we are approaching 10 centimeters or better. And a very, very uh, complex uh, error budget uh, is done in order to guarantee this fact. And you can see here uh, a sketch of the NASA uh, network of station. There is an, an equivalent uh, network by European space agencies and by other space agencies as well. Okay, uh, now uh, gravitation, uh, as we have seen, it's uh, also very, very important in order to probe the internal structure of bodies we are approaching. Indeed, it's one of the few ways. The other is, if we are able, seismometry or magnetic field. So it's a very, very powerful instrument. And uh, indeed, you can see here uh, a very recent map of the so-called free hair gravity anomalies. Here, expressed as acceleration, and here converted into an equivalent height of planet Mercury. Uh, from these maps, a host of uh, geodetical and geophysical information can be uh, obtained from the body. For example, as in the case of Mercury, one of the outstanding uh, problems is, is uh, does Mercury have at, at least partially uh, fluid core in order to produce, for example, a magnetic field? Well, this information is very crucial in order to do that. Uh, by the way, you can uh, wonder why in this figure the upper half of, this, uh, of the plot is very well resolved while uh, the lower part is not. This is not a blurring of uh, the image. It is indeed a consequence of the very elliptical orbit of Messenger with which this map was produced. And the fact that uh, uh, in the northern hemisphere, the probe was uh, a little bit more <laughs> close to the surface of the planet than in the southern hemisphere. And so this fact produces a much more detailed map uh, for messenger. With Baby Colombo, we hope to have a much more uniform uh, map. Okay, as I said, evidence is accumulated on the existence of an outer molten core of Mercury, which should be consistent with the presence of a global magnetic field. And uh, another, another very important byproduct of a space mission is uh, a continuous refinement of the solar system ephemerides. The ephemerides are simply tables, we, in modern terms we should say are models of the motion of the various body in the solar system. And each uh, probe which is launched and tracked constitutes an improvement of these ephemerides. We can say, in other words, that each uh, probe which is successfully launched and arrives at um, its destination, it's uh, a dedicated test of the fundamental physical laws of gravitation. So Newtonian physics or general relativity in their respective uh, field of, of uh, approximation 
are continuously tested. And so we have a, a very strong confidence that at least in the domain of the solar system, these gravitational laws work very well. Okay, now we go a little bit into the details of uh, Baby Colombo. Uh, Baby Colombo uh, features a very complete uh, radio science experiment package, which features uh, four basic instruments which uh, would uh, uh, produce the data to um, do a three, uh, we, 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 we put in three different names. Indeed, they are a unique uh, experiment. Uh, we, we, we speak about gravity experiment, rotation experiment, and fundamental physics experiment. Uh, the basic objective are the study of the gravitational field of Mercury in order to get information on its geology and geophysics, rotational, uh, in order to have further information on its uh, uh, structure and composition, and fundamental physics tests, uh, general relativity theory. Uh, more into details, uh, and uh, the gravity and rotation, uh, here the gravity and rotation part objective, and uh, in particular, it is interesting to notice this uh, so-called PLS formula, which uh, it's a very elegant way to try to measure the ratio between the moment of inertia of the crust mantle part of Mercury with respect to the total moment of, in of inertia of the body. The, the idea is that if uh, Mercury has uh, a liquid, uh, uh, at least partially liquid uh, uh, core, in some way, the external part of the planet is decoupled from, mechanically decoupled, at least partially, with respect to the core of the planet. And so we should see more or less indirectly from the rotational uh, dynamics of the planet itself. And we can decouple this ratio in three parts. One can be measured by the amplitude of the so-called fossil librations in longitude, which are librations appearing mainly in the equatorial plane of the planet due to the gravitational forcing of the sun. We have to remember that the orbit of Mercury uh, around the sun is very elliptical, so this forcing is periodical, on the uh, bulge of the planet. Second term, can be obtained by the C22 Stokes harmonic coefficient of the gravitational field of the planet, and the third from the obliquity uh, of the rotation axis. The obliquity is the angle between the rotation axis and the uh, revolution plane of, uh, of Mercury, which is not exactly the ecliptic. We know that uh, Mercury in, is in the so-called Cassini state of rotation. Fundamental physics uh, of several different uh, results we hope to obtain. Uh, first of all, testing general relativity to a level better than 10 to the minus 5 by measuring uh, precisely the orbit of Mercury around the Sun. And by doing a replica of the famous test of Mercury per ion precession. Then other tests uh, could be performed uh, strong equivalence principle, we have a reduced three-body problem, uh, Mercury, Sun, and uh, spacecraft. And so the spacecraft and the Mercury have fallen together in the gravitational field of the Sun. Then other tests, and we have already uh, learned a lot of things by the previous uh, presentation. Uh, one uh, word uh, on uh, one of the other classical tests of general relativity. Uh, during uh, the very long cruise, Roberto yes, 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 thank. During the very long cruise, uh, it is will be possible to replicate uh, a measurement of the uh, so-called Shapiro time delay, so the delay of the photons uh, propagated between uh, ground station and the uh, uh, spacecraft. We have to remember that uh, these are very useful in order to constrain the so-called gamma PPM parameter, 
and the best results that we have it's from another space mission Cassini and uh, we speak just uh, just uh, to compare these uh, two tables one taken from the review of will in 2014 and the other from a very recent article by Luciano Yes and collaborators. And you can compare the current uh, best limits on the PPM parameters, gamma, beta, and uh, the alpha ones, and what is uh, expected from uh, Baby Colombo in the future. Okay, uh, so um, the way to Mercury will be very long. Uh, reaching uh, the inner part of the solar system will require more than six years uh, cruise with one Earth, two Venus, and six Mercury flyby. And here on the right, you can see a very recent, beautiful uh, picture taken from the first of the six Mercury flybys. Here it is the uh, the probe, the, um, our colleagues have a very uh, nice idea of putting uh, a very simple camera uh, with which to take this very beautiful picture. And you can see, indeed, this is the planet Mercury with a very well-known uh, feature on, on this part of the planet. Okay, uh, just a few slides. Uh, Baby Colombo will be uh, interesting also for another thing. So it will be the first mission to host uh, an high uh, sensitivity uh, accelerometer, I mean a deep space mission. Up to now, the use of accelerometers, which are devices which are useful in order to uh, measure depending on the case, gravitational or non-gravitational accelerations, it it is the first time that will be used. Uh, why? Uh, because uh, uh, once uh, around Mercury, the probe will be subject to a very intense uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation from the sun. Uh, it, the distance uh, between the average distance between Mercury and the sun is uh, 50 million kilometers, one third of the astronomical unit. So we expect that the dy dynamical radiation pressure coming from the sun could significantly perturb uh, the trajectory. And uh, the usual way uh, now to do that, it's all model, this, but it's modeling is very complicated, how to measure it. And indeed, an accelerometer is uh, a device which could measure this, uh, this radiation. An accelerometer is basically a, a test mass inside the spacecraft connected to the frame of the spacecraft by a spring. And uh, the motion of uh, this mass, carefully measured, will uh, enable a measurement of this non-gravitational acceleration. And by the way, we can notice that uh, the, the very working of uh, each accelerometer is based on the validity of the wake equivalence principle. Since uh, Ideally, gravity acts the same way both on the spacecraft and on the test mass. Uh, Baby Colombo will host the so-called Italian Spring Accelerometer, which is a mechanical uh, a, a set of three electromechanical oscillators, which uh, will uh, measure the three components of the uh, accelerator, acceleration vector acting on a reference point of the spacecraft. Here you can see here and integrated into the the Hempio Mercury planetary orbiter spacecraft. This is the accelerometer. And uh, uh, here it is the we call, can call it the first light of the accelerometer in uh, at the end of 2018. Uh, here it is a picture I taken at uh, ESOC in Darmstadt, in which you can see the is a on uh, command, and uh, and this is uh, uh, the last uh, view graphs. I can show you some preliminary sample data taken uh, during instrument commissioning. We are uh, processing uh, the data, and in the near future, hopefully, new data will be released. You can see here, in particular, the boundary between the two periods, one way where in the spacecraft there is uh, a lot of mechanical activity, and the other one which is apparently there is no activity. Indeed, if you 
zoom it in, uh, you will notice a lot of signal indeed. And you can see indeed the, the spectra of this signal. And uh, here it is another interesting uh, picture. It's a spectrogram uh, uh, taken in a period where there is uh, onboard activity. In this case, the uh, very clear signatures of the reaction wheels acting on uh, on board. And so uh, we will we'll see. Uh, now, uh, Baby Colombo is good health. It's uh, traveling toward Mercury, and we expect... Uh, uh, it to reach the planet in some in some years. As I said, very, very long journey. Just uh, uh, just uh, uh, last slide. Uh, uh, if we try to widen the side, this is a, a very interesting um, plot graph taken from uh, by a view of Slava Turishev in more than ten years ago. But I think it should be still uh, important, in which he tries to put in context uh, all the available techniques and uh, experimental results compared to theories, alternative theories of gravitation, and uh, comparing it to the scale of the experiment, from the micrometric scale to laboratory tests to solar system and so on up to cosmological scales. And uh, we can say that uh, what I've shown here can be placed uh, in the part of uh, here between, uh, okay, one some astronomical units we can see. And in this part, uh, we can see that, uh, we can conclude that each test uh, is uh, continued to uh, confirm uh, the theoretical scenario given us by general relativity. And we know very well uh, that uh, this is not the case at other scales. And once more, what is important, will be important much more in the future, is to have very well precisely uh, done experiment and very well uh, uh, defined observables, that we know that uh, general relativity, unlike uh, simpler theories like Newtonian physics, is not so simple to get the uh, answer from an uh, experiment we do, since we have to be very careful in order to make the, uh, we can say, the good questions to nature. So we have a good definition of observables. So good. thank you. Good. Thank you very much, Roberto, bringing us uh, uh, through this uh, multi-year flyby uh, to reach M Mercury and this uh, beautiful uh, technological development for uh, general relativity. We agree with you that these tests are very essential, like the previous one, of course, which were performed on planet Earth from Lamarzal. Uh, okay, we have possibly um, time for uh, a urgent question. Uh, uh, good morning. I, I have one question. Can I ask my question? Please. Uh, oh, thank you so much for your very nice uh, presentation. Uh, my question uh, is about the... Uh, uh, what model was used to calculate the post-Newtonian gamma parameter uh, using Cassini satellite observations, and then what is the reason of this uh, uh, discrepancy and differences between the uh, baseline models uh, and observations and the Cassini Cassini results? Okay, uh, the LBI result has one order difference with the Cassini result is uh, ten to minus four and ten to minus five. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, these uh, uh, predictions of generativity are rather classical. Uh, they can be obtained uh, by a with a called standard formulation of post-Newtonian metric in which uh, basically it is the sun which produces the perturbation. Uh, what, uh, what I have shown uh, is that the 10 to a minus 5, 4, 6 is not, uh, it, it is the error bar. Basically, all, uh, all uh, observations we have in the solar system are compatible with uh, uh, post-Newtonian parameters, beta, gamma, and so on, between, 
being the ones predicted by general relativity. So uh, the difference between these various measurements, Cassini, the, me the, the measurement will, which will be uh, done by Bepi Colombo, and other past measurements are basically on the error bar. So what we are assisting is a, very, a continuous shrinking of the error bar towards what is the prediction of general relativity. Of course, from the, an experimental point of view, this could have not been so. Uh, I think that we share the fact that uh, general relativity has something special with respect to our. I mean, other... I mean uh, which one we can, uh, which one we can select for our uh, data uh, comparison? For example, if we want to uh, make a concordance between the, re the theoretical result and also the observations, we take which one? Which one is better, uh, VL, VLBI or Cassini result? Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I think that there is agreement in the scientific community that the Cassini results are the better one. But, but of course, if you are comparing several techniques, each technique has its own systematics. So at the end of the story, uh, the, the more, the better. So th that's why it's important to repeat this uh, experiment with a different probe, perhaps a different uh, uh, technique, uh, different instruments. Uh, the observable, we can say, uh, the, the post-Newtonian parameters are just a way to uh, obtain a, a good parameterization of the space of the theories around the general relativity, not much more. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, very long story. <laughs> Let's leave this for uh, direct contact between you and the other people. And uh, thank you again for the beautiful presentation. Okay. And let's remember always our good friend, Bep Colombo, which both of us very well and admire. Thanks. Okay. And let's go to the next talk. Uh, I'm sorry, um, Professor Safari, we, we are late, uh, uh, but uh, you will have uh, 25 minutes plus five minutes discussion. We are starting a little late, but please keep uh, go on. The role of brightening in the heating of solar corona. Please. Hello, hello everyone. Hello, Remo. Uh, did you hear me? Very well. Yeah, very well. Thank you so much. Uh, let me to uh, share screen, share my screen. Do you have my screen? Yes. Uh, Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, today I will talk about the uh, uh, about the role of brightenings in the heating of the solar corona. We use the solar dynamic observatory uh, data and solar orbital data. Uh, this is uh, this is the sharing work of me and uh, uh, Dr. Nasiba Alipur. This is a part of her PhD thesis, and also uh, she continued in uh, her postdoc at the University of Saint John. We also collaborated in this regard with the uh, Royal Observatory Belgium Campfire Team for solar orbiter. Uh, corona heating is uh, corona heating puzzle is uh, a vexing puzzle from seven decades ago. Uh, as you know, the temperature at the solar surface, at the photosphere, I mean, is about six thousand degree, and it is uh, steadily increases up to several million kilovolts at the corona. This, this problem, uh, there is no uh, definite solution to response to the heating of the solar corona of the no, but many mechanisms such as uh, acoustic 
uh, wave heating, alphonic wave heating, uh, fast and slow magnet acoustic wave heating, uh, and uh, also current shift dissipated uh, uh, proposed by Parker. Uh, uh, but there is not uh, the exact solution for this uh, coronal heating problem. Here, we would like to focus on the uh, small scale heating, the rule of the small scale heating, the brightenings on the coronal heating. We focus on uh, analyzes coronal bright points uh, as in many active regions and also we study campfires, the new terms at the solar orbiter, and they are the most uh, similar to the so most similar or the most uh, mini miniature flares. Uh, brightenings uh, such as coronal bright points and campfires are the small scale features, and uh, they are widespread in the solar corona. Uh, and uh, uh, on, on to know the, the con their contribution in the heating of the solar corona has not uh, determined yet. You see in this slide an example of uh, a bright point in which uh, a brightening region at the apex of a uh, coronal loop consists of several strands. And uh, this is an example of coronal bright points. Uh, the, the, key, the key step to understand uh, and estimate the contribution of uh, the small scale brightenings in the heating of the solar corona is to, to identify and track all of them in the solar data. Here we applied an automatic detection method for uh, coronal bright points and campfire based on machine learning method. Our method consists of Zernik moments, which we computed uh, Zernik moments for each sub images, and then we fed to a support vector machine classifier as a machine. We used the solar dynamic observatory data. Uh, atmospheric imaging assembly data at 171 angstrom emissions and uh, um, also we used the uh, solar orbiter data high resolution imaging at extra ultraviolet uh, the distance of the solar orbiter the recent uh, instrument ESA and NASA cooperated in this instrument is about 0.5 uh, uh, astronomical unit from the sun, and the highlight uh, mission of this instrument is the closest ever images of the sun, and the first for the first time it can be uh, take image from the polar regions from the uh, polar region of the solar system. Uh, here you see that the Zernik moments uh, um, functions, the two dimensional uh, functions we use. Uh, sorry, there's a question. Uh, uh, you see the Zernik moments uh, in this. Uh, it's, it's defined in the uh, polar coordinates. In R and theta coordinate, we first we uh, converted uh, an image to polar coordinate in a unit disk, and then we compute the Zernik ones for a given order and reputation number P and Q. If we put uh, image in here, we, we can compute the Zernik moments uh, for each of uh, P and Q number. There is several reasons for us, how why we use the uh, Zernik moments. Actually, the Zernik moments uh, are, the absolute value of the Zernik moments are uh, rotation invariance. You see uh, an, a same active vision from two different perspectives. A stereo A and a stereo B uh, observe the same active vision from two different perspectives. And here you see the very similar flux structure for Zernik moments. 
uh, and uh, this uh, this means this implies that uh, the zero moments is rotation invariant. Uh, also, you can see in this slide uh, applying some image normalization. Oh, sorry. On some image normalization, we can make the zernic moments as scale and translation invariances. Uh, for uh, for an same for a same uh, activation from uh, observed by solar dynamic observatory AIA and also observed by SOHO EIT, we see also a similar uh, Lock structures and overall similar structures in from two different uh, perspective and two different distances from the sun. This is this shows that the zero elements also uh, are the scale and translation invariances. Uh, here, uh, here I show that um, how, what what uh, what is the rule for choosing the maximum order number. We use uh, uh, we uh, we computed the zero moments for each sub images. I mean, for the sub images you can see in this in this uh, original image for an original image of uh, uh, a feature in, in the solar data, and then we computed the zero moments for this feature and reconstructed it. Uh, for for a maximum order number of nine, you see the overall shape overall shape of the feature uh, is appeared and increasing the maximum order number, the, uh, the, the structure, the fine structures, and the details of the uh, image is appeared. And uh, we uh, computed the, the reconstruction error, uh, the differences between the original image and reconstructed image, we find that the uh, maximum order number about 31 is the best one for our analysis. <clears throat> the main reason for using the Zernik moment to describe uh, an image for us is the Zernik polynomials, as shown in the previous slides, are two-dimensional orthogonal functions and orthogonal function uh, complex sets. And so it means if we converted an image to a one-dimensional finite array, the Zernik moments uh, should be unique and independent signatures. Uh, and also, uh, as I shown in the reconstruction role, using a finite number of Zernik moments, we can reconstruct the image. And uh, so it means that Zernik moments can uh, carefully describe the image. Uh, also, Zernik moments are less sensitive to the noise and the absolute value of zero moments are rotation invariance and applying by some image normalization it can be uh, it can be made into the uh, escape and translation invariances and uh, uh, as shown in my previous slides zero moments can describe the geometry and the morphology and also detailed structure of an of the object inside an image uh, we use the superfactor machine uh, classifier uh, to identify the feature. After computing the the uh, zero moments for each sub images, we trained this uh, zero moments to a machine, to, to a superfactor SVM machine. SVM machine originally designed for two class problems, two class. Uh, statistics problems, and so it is very useful for us uh, due to uh, we face with uh, with the face with uh, 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 coronal bright points or campfires. Uh, each of them are one class, and other class is uh, the non-event. So we face with uh, two uh, two class in, uh, two class uh, problem. Uh, we use the Gaussian kernel function classifier in this project. Uh, I show some example of 
brightenings uh, of campfires as a brightenings, EUV brightenings, uh, even that uh, parts of a uh, loop or uh, elongated loop or apex of a loop and non-campfires, the, uh, the negative class for, for our training sets is to be part of large loops or the regions which we not observe a, a significant feature inside it. Uh, the flowchart of our algorithm uh, shown here with uh, some uh, essential steps, data selection, we, uh, we collected 700, for example, campfires and 700 non-campfires, solid mages, by visual inspection, and then we computed the Zernic moments, and then we fed uh, to a classifier uh, in the training step, and finally we check the uh, and we test the uh, the performance of the classifier as, as shown here. You see that we you, we computed recall for positive classifier for positive class recall for negative class, and the important score for us, the, the, the last one, the true statistics is obtained, and this, this value shows that our machine is well trained and know we can apply to the image. Uh, we applied the machine learning classifier to solar orbital images, as you see the date in here, or EY image, we obtain more than 300 coronal bright points in this feature and more than 400 campfires as shown the, the, the contours uh, uh, in this image. Uh, we find that some of campfires associated with coronal bright points are uh, all, uh, they hosted by some Bright point. This is a large bright point, as we observe, and uh, nine campfire inside this bright point, as we shown. <clears throat> Here, we made a video for our detection and tracking algorithm to see campfires as detected by this algorithm here, and. Uh, we think the performance of this classifier, this, this network, is really high and it is robust to apply for all images. And also, I show an, another image, another feature in here, uh, with the duration of lifetime about 245 seconds. Uh, Briefly, the statistics of campfire for five minutes uh, as observation of uh, solar orbiter for fifty sequ for a sequence of fifty UI images at one hundred seventy four angstrom. You see, we observed about more than uh, nine thousand campfires for uh, fifty images, and also we find that more than 3,000 of them have the lifetime larger than five seconds. The cadence of our uh, images is about five seconds, and this means uh, most of these features are really uh, not noises, and campfires inside, appear inside or associated uh, with the CVPs are more than 4,300. We computed the birth rate for campfires in here, dividing the number of detected campfires to the area of the study and the, uh, the time interval of 50 images. We find the, the birth rate is about 2.2, 10 to minus 60 per meter square per second, and it is uh, roughly uh, equal to the explosive events. Uh, also, we, uh, in this slide, I should be showed that what, what, what is the locations, where is the locations of the campfires. We find that most of them are, uh, are placed in the supergranular junctions and boundaries, as we expected, the, the place of high concentration of magnetic fields 
to, to determine the uh, supergranular junctions, we, we use solar dynamic observatory HMI magnetogram data to find the, uh, the, the, the boundary of the supergranular junctions by method of uh, bolt tracking, by the uh, bolt tracking method. Also, we applied the method to the um, to the eight years of STO AIA at 171 angstrom images, we find uh, more than uh, 140,000 coronal black points in uh, STO AIA images. And in this uh, image, you see more than 800 coronal black points at one from solar full disk images. Uh, no, after identification and tracking of the features, we can compute the energetics of uh, solar coronal bright points. We are not yet determined the camp iron energies, but we published the uh, result for the coronal five, bright points in this five paper. Minutes yeah. more, five minutes more. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, we analyze coronal bright points in uh, six AIA channels, as you may hear. And uh, these channels observe different layers of the solar corona. And so we used, uh, uh, we used a differential emission measure to observe, to, to compute, to calculate the energy loss flux for each coronal bright points. We compute, uh, then we compute the radiation and conductive flux, flux for each of uh, features. The sum of uh, radiation and uh, conduction is the energy loss flux, total energy loss flux for each features. So the result in here, uh, let me discuss this very important result. We show the probability distribution function for energy of the coronal bright points, as, as I, I shown here. And uh, we, we fit, we uh, describe a power law model at the tail of this method, tail of this distribution. We find the power law index uh, is about uh, larger than 2.7. 52, uh, and we uh, we uh, for, uh, we use three different approaches to find this power law index for the distribution, and we find that there is the, the rule for the, the contribution for uh, the system of coronal bright points. To heat the corona, uh, to heat the solar corona is about 1.6 percent, and if we compare it with Wittbro values for the quiet sun, if we continue uh, this distribution to a smaller features, to the nanoflares, uh, and also campfires and nanoflares, the campfire energy uh, will be held at at this region, and if we continue this distribution with the same power law index for a smaller, uh, smaller energies, we can compute the, the contribution of the uh, small scale events in the heating of the quiet sun corona. We obtain that this, 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 this uh, features have the contribution about 78% in the to heat the solar corona, but we we not validate this result because we need to uh, continue our work for campfires energy, and then we can uh, validate this result for small scale events. Very thank good. you so much. Thank you. Thank you very very much. Um, let's see if we. Very, very interesting. And, <coughs> and um, uh, let's see if there are questions. Hello? 
Yeah, I'm ready for questions and comments. Thank you for your attention. Yes. Uh, is... Hussain, can, uh, can you hear me? Uh, may I have a question? Yeah. Yes. Please. Yeah, yeah. Please yourself, uh, because uh, I have only uh, seen my presentation and I'm not see the, uh, the, the the your name. It's okay. So, I'm it... Surush. You know me. Uh, so, yeah. uh, you know, my your... question is about in, in one of the slides you were you were talking about the prediction of the flares in the sun. So, yeah. Uh, in yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, can you please explain me a bit about the uh, the parameter space of this prediction, or the, uh, a bit explain about the detail of that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, actually, we uh, developed this method, this machine learning method, firstly for prediction of the solar flares, large solar flares. Let me to back to that slide. This one. Uh, we published this uh, result for prediction of solar flares in astrophysical journal supplement series, and uh, we show that our method predicts the flares within 10 days before they occur on, on the sun. And then we applied this method of uh, machine learning to identify and detect and track the small scale features in order to solve, maybe solve the corona heating problem. In this, this is the first time we use the machine learning method to detect the features on the sun um, for, for corona heating. Yeah, we, uh, we also uh, uh, shared our result about the campfires with ROV team. I see. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, there are no more questions. We can proceed to the next uh, lecture by Professor Tabata Bae Fateme, uncovering the energetic of the interstellar and the intergalactic medium with the sky. With sky. Fateme, please. Uh, you can start. Hello. <clears throat> can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, well. So, um, did I share? So, can you see my screen as well? Beautiful picture of a mountain. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you see that? Uh, Fatima, you have to show your entire screen, please. Oh, okay. So, can you stop sharing and again share? Uh, when I say share... Please choose the entire screen. Uh, there is no this option. Maybe I should say system preferences. Um, no, I don't have this kind of option here. It just say share. And then when I do that, you cannot see my presentation? No, we can't see, just go to. Maybe you have to close that. Oh, okay. So maybe I should. Maybe, maybe I should come. Maybe I should go uh, out and again come in, perhaps. Okay. Sorry.
de Zitwok, so who should do follow, please? Uh, Professor Rufini, I, I'm hearing you. Yes, please. Uh, uh, you you mentioned me? Yes, to follow uh, this matter. Yes, okay. Okay, I will send you an email uh, right away. Yes. Hi, so I think that I'm going to because I was installing it and I was just using it. Now, if I can share, now I see that in the entire screen, yes. Yes. Okay, because I was using my own uh, installed one and it was not, there was no to. this option there. Great, great. Okay. Now we can see all the screen. Please okay, go ahead. Great, thank you. Okay. Thank yeah. you, Ami. <clears throat> So hello everyone. Um, sorry, I'm Fatima Tabatabayi, a faculty member at the Institute for Research in Fundamental Sciences, IPM, and an ex-researcher at Max Planck Institute uh, for Astronomy and Radio Astronomy and at IAC in Spain. Uh, I think that uh, many of you have seen very beautiful uh, cosmological simulations uh, made by the EGLE uh, Hydrodynamic Group. Uh, which nicely show how galaxies form uh, after merging the dark matter halos. And this star formation actually is fed by the accretion of the cold gas uh, from the intergalactic medium. Uh, however, uh, these uh, simulations uh, and models actually uh, can face to some difficulties if they want to uh, explain the uh, evolution of the galaxies. Observations show that actually galaxies quench over cosmic time as uh, uh, they shut down their massive star formation with time. Uh, on the other hand, their stellar mass increases. Uh, so um, their suggestion, uh, the suggestion of these models to explain uh, these um, star formation evolution uh, is the feedback. So these are the thermal radiation or the beams from the supernova and Aegean um, in these galaxies. Um, in other words, um, uh, the uh, quenching of the star formation causes because of a loss in cool gas, uh, because uh, uh, the uh, star formation needs the cool gas to form, uh, to form, and this can be ca uh, caused by the uh, feedback either or a drop in the IG IGM accretion rate. However, observations show that feedback can actually be positive. It means that it can uh, trigger formation of the new stars. Uh, on the other hand, observations in millimeter, like uh, that in Al with Alma, uh, show that uh, cool gas uh, has been always uh, available to the galaxies to form stars. But for an unknown reason, uh, they do not form. It means that it is the star formation efficiency actually which drops uh, over the cosmic time. And it's interesting to note that there are lots of hidden quiescent gal uh, gas in galaxies, which has been uh, resolved uh, in nearby galaxies, but uh, we miss this uh, amount of the gas in integrated studies at high redshift. So what can prevent cool gas to form stars? So we should uh, go back to the uh, basic physics of the ISM and IGM and uh, see what um, agents uh, could have a larger pressure and what uh, actually what's the state of the energy balance and the pressure balance. As you know, the ISM in galaxies is a multi-phase uh, ISM. It means that it, uh, con it's consisted of thermal, turbulent and relativistic uh, parts. Uh, it's not only about the gas and dust, but also the magnetic fields and high energy particles, uh, which actually shape the relativistic and non-thermal uh, part of the ISM. So uh, radio studies in nearby galaxies show that the non-thermal pressure, uh, which is based on the cosmic rays and magnetic field, can be uh, higher than the thermal pressure uh, in normal star-forming galaxies, 
uh, by more than one order of magnitude. This has been observed in M33, uh, the Magellanic Clouds, and 6946. So, um, does this mean that uh, the cosmic rays and magnetic fields can actually trigger the uh, uh, feedback, for instance, the winds and outflows? Well, this has been uh, shown in our uh, other works, which was the radio follow the study of the King Fisher project, uh, showing that the uh, galaxies which have higher star formation rate have a stronger magnetic field. Uh, but on the other hand, their synchrotron uh, spectrum or the cosmic ray energy spectrum is flatter. How we can explain this? This cannot be explained uh, only by the fact that uh, in the higher star forming galaxies, the magnetic field has kind of tangled morphology. And the, uh, there is a, a, scatter, a scattering of the high energy cosmic rays from the pitch angles of the magnetic field. Uh, that, that this way they do not lose their energy to the synchrotron. And they just uh, stream out the decouple from the magnetic field and they can uh, cause a strong uh, pressure gradients and uh, actually trigger winds and outflows in galaxies. Uh, so I don't know uh, if, you, if you see uh, one other my picture, I cannot see that. So, but what I wanted to say here is that uh, the uh, role of the non-thermal uh, pressure can be even more important in the center of the galaxies. As you know, this is seen by the uh, Fermi bubbles, uh, gamma ray bubbles in the uh, Milky Way. And uh, you, you can see here that uh, this is actually uh, can be due to the strong magnetic field. Uh, this has been observed by the radio Meerkat uh, telescope. Uh, so uh, how if we have uh, cool gas in the galaxy center and uh, what does this non-thermal pr uh, pressure uh, do for the formation of these stars? Oh, so here you can see these Fermi balls. Um, okay, so um, we have done a, a work, a research, which has been published in the Nature Astronomy, uh, showing that in the central uh, kiloparsec region of the NGC 1097, which has a supermassive black hole, um, and also uh, has lots of uh, uh, gas, cold gas, uh, is uh, star forming, not clearing. Uh, but these molecular crowds are very uh, low uh, star forming efficient. So what causes this? We have compared this with the magnetic field, which is traced uh, by the synchro radio synchrotron emission, and uh, found a good correlation between magnetic field and the density of the gas. It means that they are coupled. And interestingly, we found that these clouds are uh, subcritical. It means that the magnetic field is controlling the collapse of the gas. Uh, and the star formation rates per free fall, if you plot it versus magnetic field, you find an anti-correlation, while there is no correlation with the turbulence. So uh, similar behavior you can also see in a couple of uh, cases at very larger scales uh, in the intergalactic medium. So uh, for instance, in the antenna galaxies, there is a uh, gigantic uh, 20 kiloparsec polarized radio continuum tail, uh, which does not form stars, while there, there are uh, plenty of gas in this, their H1 and CO. And for instance, in the Tophi galaxies, as you see here, uh, there is also similar thing. So uh, this means that uh, the uh, non thermal pressure from cosmic rays and magnetic fields. Uh, should be taken more serious in these uh, galaxy evolution studies and deeper radio uh, observations actually are needed uh, to, to be done uh, for a larger sample of galaxies and also at higher redshifts. Well, with the current radio telescope, this may be difficult, but uh, with the uh, square kilometer array, uh, which is going to be the largest radio um, uh, telescope today, uh, uh, it is going to be a solution, actually. So it would be uh, 50 times more sensitive and uh, 10,000 faster than the NIST radio telescopes we have today. And uh, actually, uh, this is a, a project, uh, international project, which is going to be 
uh, uh, built in two phases. Uh, phase one, uh, the construction would be uh, finished till 2027. Okay, the dates which are here um, uh, is postponed due to the COVID-19 situation. And the phase two starts uh, mid, it says 2020, but I say that it's uh, uh, later. Uh, so they are. Uh, they will start with a smaller number of the uh, dishes and uh, antennas in phase one, and then in phase two they will complete it. Uh, so the places uh, they considered uh, are uh, Australia, uh, which uh, has the low frequency uh, components uh, between 50 to uh, 350 megahertz. And in the South Africa parts, in the desert, remote desert, uh, we will cover the frequencies uh, at 350 to 24 gigahertz. So the big questions which SK can answer with such sensitivity and resolution uh, actually can be a wide range of questions in physics and fundamental physics and cosmology. Uh, so, um, for instance, the uh, dark energy, dark matter, uh, cosmic magnetism, and uh, general relativity, particle, astroparticle physics, and so on. Uh, especially now, uh, thanks to uh, the uh, dark energy camera surveys and also HST surveys of the um, dark matter which are mapping this uh, uh, in the clusters of galaxies and very large scales um, the SKA would be uh, would provide this opportunity to compare the synchrotron emission with these large scale structures to see about the uh, entity of the dark matter if it is like the uh, weak interacting uh, particles or uh, so uh, so there are several science working groups for the SKA, uh, which is, I think, is always open to the uh, science uh, communities. Uh, so if you want to join, you can contact them or just uh, send an email to me. Uh, so as I said, it's an international project. Uh, it's uh, right now there are uh, 13 countries which have officially uh, uh, have been joined. Uh, this project, but uh, larger than 100 organizations and institutes uh, are also uh, a member. Uh, so Iran hopefully uh, will join in near future. But uh, right now, um, the uh, IPM Institute in Tehran uh, have already um, contribution and activities in the SKA project. Uh, for instance, it's a member of the uh, SWGs. Uh, it has proposed and chaired a, a, a focus group and also uh, it has uh, contributed in the data challenges uh, and um, it has uh, prepared the science use case for the SKA1 surveys and it uh, is taking part at the SKA Pathfinder survey projects such as Meerkat. So for the uh, data challenge, you know that uh, handling the data is actually a big challenge for the SKA uh, with such huge amount of the data which are uh, uh, going to have. Uh, so they have uh, prepared simulations uh, uh, in order to actually prepare the uh, scientific society to uh, to handle to, uh, to be with this to work with this uh, uh, big amount of data. Uh, so we have taken part in this data challenge, the IPM, and uh, the, uh, the, we have used the actually uh, both the traditional uh, source finding uh, algorithms and also uh, the uh, machine learning alg algorithm, which the results you can find in this published uh, paper in uh, MNRAS. And uh, regarding the uh, focus group that we proposed uh, is about the structure formation and energy balance parallel to what I uh, actually introduced at the beginning. Uh, so the main goals are uh, actually what's the role of the thermal and non-thermal processes in the formation and evolution of galaxies, and uh, how does the uh, energy balance in the ISM IGM change over cosmic time, and what physical processes actually govern the structure formation of various scales. So to know this, first we should, uh, because we are using the radio continuum, uh, and uh, the radio continuum actually is a mixed uh, 
uh, it, as a tracer of both thermal and non-thermal uh, processes, we should see how to separate these. Uh, we already have uh, the thermal and non-thermal maps separated uh, in nearby galaxies, and uh, uh, thanks to the observations with the BLA and the uh, uh, TRT um, uh, separation technique, which you can uh, find in these uh, references. Uh, interestingly, both thermal and non-thermal uh, emission correlate with the star formation rates. And as the star formation rates evolve uh, with the Z or with the cosmic time, then we can use the correlation between the star formation and thermal non-thermal radio continuum to obtain uh, a, the prescription uh, for the uh, evolution of the thermal and non-thermal emission with the redshift. Uh, well, here we, co uh, we consider two cases because we are uh, working with the surface uh, brightnesses and depending on the uh, galaxy size evolution, uh, we may have different uh, prescriptions. Uh, so uh, here are uh, using these, those prescriptions actually we can simulate and also taking into account the uh, configuration of the SKA and also uh, the redshift evolution, angular and spatial scale and also the resampling toward the higher shifts and also injecting the noise to the maps, uh, we uh, can produce these simulated maps of the thermal and non-thermal emission for galaxies which are similar to normal M51, 6946, and M33. So here is the resulting uh, evolution of the thermal fraction uh, of the radio continuum emission, uh, which means that uh, uh, if, uh, we, we, if the galaxy size do, uh, does not evolve, uh, there is a in, uh, continuous increase with redshift. Uh, but uh, if the galaxy size is evolved, uh, there is a bump around uh, the redshift of one because the thermal emission drops faster than the total radio continuum emission. Uh, this is more important to see if uh, the SK, the, because the SK has some proposed uh, standard uh, surveys um, at bands, so uh, for, for instance, uh, several bands, several frequency bands. And it would be interesting to see if uh, these reference surveys can actually detect these kind of normal star forming galaxies and at what, uh, up to what redshift. So we have uh, also compared with the uh, sensitivities of different surveys like wide tier, which has a bigger uh, field of view, but the RMS is only one microgenski, or deep tier, which is uh, about deeper 0.2 microgenski, and the ultra deep tier 0.05 microgenski. And we find that, for instance, uh, uh, wide tier can only see uh, M51 like galaxies, but it's uh, like two sigma, it's hardly. Uh, and it's only in case two, uh, and the deep tier can be M51 and 6946, but not M33. And other ultra deep tier can see the M33 kind of galaxies, which is kind of a low mass dwarf galaxy, uh, up to a redshift of 0.5. So if we want to study dwarf galaxies, we should go uh, to deeper observations, which uh, hopefully will come with the SKA phase two. So, um, in terms of the synchrotron spectral index analysis, uh, we find that the, uh, there is a flattening towards higher redshifts. Uh, this indicates that the cosmic ray electrons actually uh, are more energetic at higher redshifts, uh, which can be uh, reasonable because uh, the activity of the star formation uh, is actually higher at higher redshift. So, uh, according to this evolution, we can also uh, construct the uh, mid radio SCD, which is uh, the spectral energy distribution of the radio continuum between 1 to 10 gigahertz. So, here I show it uh, for a M51 like galaxy. Uh, so, you see that the, if you want to observe uh, galaxies at the epoch of uh, star formation, maximum star formation, then you should also use band 1. And uh, while the surveys only uh, before this uh, study uh, had been uh, concentrated on band two and band five. So we at least need to know the higher and lower end of the SED in order to get information about the spectral energy. 
And hence, Span 1 should uh, actually have a kind of a strategic importance for the SKA uh, to study the evolution of the star formation. So we proposed that and we wrote a kind of a newer science use case. Uh, in terms of the working with the SKA Pathfinder surveys, uh, so we have lots of um, uh, observations with the MIRCAD, which is a Pathfinder. Uh, so it's the project um, called MITE, uh, which is actually a 20 uh, square degree galaxy evolution survey, uh, reaching uh, down to uh, two microgenesis sensitivity in the sky. So it's uh, re uh, relatively deep uh, comparing to the current available surveys. So here uh, you see uh, the surveys done on the Cosmos in, on the left and in the right on the XMMSS uh, survey, uh, they have done follow-up observations, and um, uh, there are the, the, so the early uh, release um, data has been already published here in this uh, monthly notices paper, and uh, here I also announced the postdoc position we have uh, to work uh, with this team at IPM. Uh, so this is my summary that uh, the radio observations of a new window to the hidden universe and the way its building blocks evolve. And uh, actually, uh, SKA can resolve the ISM and IGM at the young ages of the galaxies. And dissecting the thermal and thermal processes is vital to dissect the nature of the feedback and study the energy balance and structure formation the ISM. And these are the results of the simulation. Thank you very much. Did I, I, I was following, fascinated, all your... Uh, can you hear me? Hello? Um, oh, yes, Hello? yes, yes, please. I thought that uh, uh, I was somehow uh, lost. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I was following, fascinated, this uh, uh, work of SCA, Mercat, but especially your intense activity at IPM. I congratulate you strongly. Thank you very much. On Thank behalf you. of all of us. And we hope very much to collaborate <coughs> further. Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you, Raymond. Even within, <coughs> within Internet. A really very beautiful talk. Uh, a very impressive result. Uh, can Thank you. you uh, is there any comment further? Questions? Hello? We have any uh, questions? Uh, are you asking me or from the audience? <laughs> Sorry. From the audience. I'm asking from the audience or from Raim. Okay. Because this, this talk was really remarkable. I think it was too fast. <laughs> There is no yet any feedback. Okay, in, in that case, we thank the speaker very much. Thank and, you. And, uh, and we proceed to close this uh, intense, very intense morning session, which has seen Reuker in great shape and uh, provocative and as usual, very thoughtful and realistic. And then uh, the beautiful uh, presentation of Professor Yao, giving more insight on the angular momentum role, which uh, was also very impressive following all the classic work and especially the recent, uh, the recent result of uh, um, Christo Gulu and Kleinerman. And then, of course, uh, the talk of Orge, presenting the magnetic field uh, essential role in, uh, in the neutron star uh, collapse and amplification 
in the transition from the neutron star to the black hole, which plays the fundamental role of the energy extraction from a black hole, from the, uh, the rotation from the uh, uh, Kerr solution to the reducible mass application. And uh, also the masterful presentation of uh, Klaus Lammerzahl, which keeps track of all the fundamental consequence in the experiment of uh, general relativity and, uh, uh, and uh, all the refined tests which can be obtained still about um, uh, the equivalence principle using uh, the facilities on the ground of ZARM and in space uh, from uh, the satellite, and of course, uh, also revealing has been a tribute of uh, Roberto Peron, I ask, to remind Beppo Colombo, one of the greatest scientists working in space physics, uh, who was really, we were following him uh, decades ago, until his very untimely uh, that, but uh, his mission is flourishing and will keep his name alive for many years to come. Also very interesting, the possibility of uh, this micro uh, 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 um, contribution of the solar corona, and of course, uh, concluding this uh, beautiful talk by Fateme, linking directly uh, uh, IPM to one of the greatest uh, activities uh, international, worldwide, which is uh, SCA uh, observation and uh, the early uh, results. I thank you very much, Bodhi, for this very exciting meeting of this morning. And of course, uh, uh, the uh, support uh, and the continuous driving of Sroosh to have everything going on success. Yes, and actually you were one of our heroes because you, you, you were get up at the early morning and continuously, uh, you know, you were with us all the day at the morning session. So thank you so much. Just I want to announce that the next session will be a start at 3 p.m. Iran and at uh, half past one in uh, Central European time or let's say Italy. Half past one. We have, we have around one hour in your time. One hour for the, uh, let's say, launch break. No, more then than one hour. Have... No, more than one hour. Now is... Uh... 11.30, we started at 1.30. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Half past, half past 12, sorry, sorry. Uh, three, three in Iran and, uh, sorry, and uh, I was wrong. Uh, 12 oh, and... What time we start again? In, uh, yes, half past two. Yes, when? At uh, what time we start again, Italy time? Half past 12, half past 12, sorry, I was, uh, okay, yes, 12, 30, uh, okay. 3, and Iran and 12, 30 in Italy. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, see you at 12, 30.